Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome. We are excited that you're here. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing and glad in it. Come on in, and as you come in, we welcome you to this, the Pain and Appuse Mental Health and Ministry segment. This is every uh, uh, every Monday night, 7 o'clock p.m. I am your host, Chelsea Cookie Payne, founder of Pain and Glory Incorporated. And we are excited on tonight for several reasons. And I say excited with, with clear emphasis. We're excited because, listen, if you are under the sound of my voice and you're able to hear and see us, that's a reason to be excited. That's a reason to be grateful. That's a reason to be thankful. And listen, I am happy that you are here with us as you're coming in. Thank you guys who are, who are tuning in. Thank you guys. Go ahead and feel free. I'm doing it myself. Feel free to share. We want to make sure that you share, share, share. I'm doing it myself. At this very moment, just a few clicks and boom. It's shared. So go ahead and share because you don't want to miss out on this yourself. And you certainly, certainly don't want those around you, those your loved ones, your pastors, your ministers, your leaders, your sisters, your brothers, your friends, your colleagues, your co-workers. You don't want them to miss out on this. If you're getting a good meal, you want to be able to share it, right? So we want to make sure that you are sharing sharing, sharing this great news. Again, this is the Pain and the Pews Mental Health and Ministry segment. We are with you every Monday night, 7 o'clock p.m., and we provide a different guest speaker every week, someone that can come to you and give you information, inspiration, and listen, we're talking about Pain and the Pews Mental Health and Ministry, and we are in a time where we need to hear about mental health and ministry. We need to be able to to speak on it. We need to be able to hear about it. We need to know that it is okay. I, I, I said earlier that I was going to show my shirt. I'll show my shirt a little bit uh, in, a, in a little bit so you all can see what it says. I'm going to show you um, what, what it actually says. But as you're coming on, thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for coming on. If you're not already a part of the Pain and Abuse Facebook group, we would love for you to be a part of it. We would love for you to come on over. It is Um, actually just as the name says pain in the pews Um, and it's right here on Facebook and you are more than welcome to be a part of that particular group so on tonight before we get started because tonight tonight's topic is so profound and it's so necessary for the time we're in now and tonight's speaker listen I'll get into that in a minute (laughs) I'll get into that in a minute because I'm super excited Um, but I just want to quickly really quickly, just kind of of give this um, station identification, if you will, for for what's going on right now. We're facing a lot. We're we're facing a lot. Literally, we, we all are facing a lot. And I want to encourage you on, on two fronts. I want to encourage you to continue to do the social distancing practices and the safe practices that have been handed down to us by the CDC. Um, COVID-19 is still prevalent and is mostly prevalent and highly prevalent in our Black and Brown communities, the Black, Hispanic, and Native American communities. It is extremely prevalent. Um, So we want to make sure that you are washing your hands for 20 seconds or more, that you are wearing your mask properly out, keep your nose and mouth covered. Um, If you're feeling sick, follow the guidelines that have been given. Um, Make sure that you stay six feet apart. I I know that sometimes we get comfortable or we feel like things have have calmed down or they're lax, but truth be told right here in Georgia, if you're you're not in Georgia, I can't speak to those statistics at this moment, but in, in Cobb, Gwinnett, DeKalb, Fulton counties, the numbers have increased. So we want, and that's since Memorial Day. And, and we know, we know it's the first first holiday, uh, first summer holiday. I get it. You know, people want to get together with family and friends. They want some sort of normalcy, but there's nothing normal about a pandemic. So we got to be a little uncomfortable just for a little bit. Secondly, um, I, and be, before we bring on our guests, I want to encourage you, 
staying with that same energy, the same thing that you were doing before when the pandemic began and you began to hear about all the things that it was doing to people and, and the number of deaths and the number of cases and the number of, of situations where it was unknown and it still is unknown it, how, it's, how it spread and how quickly it spread and what's a symptom, what's not a symptom, what's the difference between the flu and the cold and all, all of that. You prayed, you prayed. Whether you had a prayer life, a strong prayer life before or not, you prayed. But now that there is televised violence that is so horrendous, we're angry with good reason, we're protesting with good reason, but we've forgotten the key element and that is prayer because anger without a plan and without prayer. It's just like the scripture. Let, let, me, let me say this. The Bible says faith without works is dead, right? So if we have the faith, if, we, if we're praying and we have the faith to believe that God can, can cure us from COVID-19, that he can eradicate it, that he can you know, keep it from affecting our families and all, this wonderful thing, all these wonderful things that he has been doing, right? Then that same culture of prayer can be applied that same faith without works you put works behind it you you washed your hands you put on the mask you did the things you're supposed to do and you prayed but the, the the downside of that is if faith without works is dead then anger without a mission and without prayer leads to death death of the plan death of the purpose that you're doing it for death of the momentum, death of the passion, and if illy thought out and anger consumes you without any, any action, without any purposeful action behind it, we know that it will lead to physical death. So I encourage you, before you make moves that, before you make temporary moves based on your anger and your, and your passionate anger and sometimes unwell thought out movement, pray first. Pray first, then put action behind it. And whether your action is picking up the phone and calling your congressman or your whomever, your, your state or state representative or whatever that looks like to you, maybe your action looks like going to see if an elderly neighbor or family member is okay because we forgot about them when we were out on the street. So that's my, I'm going to step off my little soapbox, but I wanted to just make sure I just plant that seed for you. So I wanted to encourage you um, on today to uh, just give some thought to that. But I am super excited. I had the pleasure. I was invited and I don't even remember how I was invited. I think it would may have been an email um, or a direct email or it was, um, uh, I'm really not even certain. I'll just be honest but I was invited to hear our guest speaker um, and she was doing a seminar and I was like, oh my gosh, I want to, I have got to hear this. So I got on the seminar and this woman of faith was on there and she was phenomenal. So much so that, and, and you, you and I both know, and those that are listening, we know that because now we're, we are, we see things online so much, we see so much, you know, we hear it and it's like, oh, that's good. And we keep going. But in that moment, I actually went on Facebook and went into Messenger and said, listen, this was great. I had to contact her and tell her how much it meant to me. I had notes that I had taken and it was just amazing to hear a perspective on what we're, well, listen, what we're dealing with now hadn't even happened. Hadn't even happened. Had not even happened. But it was so profound that it doesn't even matter. The message was universal. It doesn't matter if, it, if she said it 10 years ago, yesterday, 10 months from today. So let me introduce to you someone that I'm telling you, she's my personal shero. I'm just going to tell you. So let, let me introduce to you Dr. Laquisha Izzard. She is the owner of Shekinah Counseling, providing services in counseling, training, supervision, mindset, mentoring, and, and career counseling. Dr. Izzard is a licensed professional counselor, LPC, 
right here in the state of Georgia. She's, she has over a decade of community mental health counseling uh, uh, experience with diverse populations. As a result of her counseling experience, she has developed faith inspiration therapy to meet the unique needs of her clients that are a part of the Christian faith. You, you already see why she's a part of this, right? I'm just saying. Dr. Izzard, or officially known as Dr. Izzy, is the standing president and founding member of the American Counseling Association of Georgia. Dr. Izzy has obtained her doctorate degree in, in counselor education and supervision and a master's of science in mental health counseling from North Atlanta A&T State University. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome Dr. Izzy. Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thank you. And thank you for, of course, that wonderful introduction that yes. you gave me. And you all, I am so excited to be here on tonight. And Ms. Payne is correct. She did see me uh, doing a webinar uh, seminar on stress, but it's a different type of stress. Mm -hmm. It is titled Secondary Traumatic Stress. And the abbreviation for it is S-T-S. But the reason why I have spoke so many times about secondary traumatic stress is because it is something that can happen to professionals. It can happen to caregivers. It can happen to faith leaders. It can happen to someone that just enjoys helping. And now, because we are experiencing a pandemic and we are experiencing things related to racial injustice, which is racial trauma, that still can be something that can cause an individual to have STS. So like she said, this had not even happened yet, but this absolutely can cause someone to end up with STS. So it is just like she said, it's universal. And even in our children, what we're seeing with our children now, and many of them, they cannot express what they're feeling and how this is affecting them. But we will be able to see more of it as the days and the weeks and the months go by, how it is affecting them. And nine times out of 10, you'll see it in their behavior. Right. And the reason why I talk about the babies too is because I was a special education teacher starting out. And I worked with children with severe behavior and emotional disorders. And I heard the things that was said about that population when I went into that population. But just let me tell you, those were the most beautiful children that I could have ever taught. And I'm so thankful to God that he allowed that to be my first experience with mental health. Wow. Because that is in turn what fostered that passion in me. I was following passion at the time, but didn't realize that it was a gift that God had put in me. So he brought me in through those babies and because I couldn't understand why they were putting certain diagnoses on these babies at right. such a very young age. And, I said, oh God, you know, you got to help me with this. So I would sit down and during my planning time, I would study their individualized, you know, education plans, their IEPs and right. go over and over and over. And I said, God, this, some of this just doesn't make sense to me. I said, Lord, you're going to have to make it plain to me. You're going to have to put this in layman terms, how I can just be here for these children. And God gave me three things. I'll never forget it. He said, show these children consistency. Mm. that's number one show them consistency you got to be the same with them every day <laughs> right. show them stability meaning that you mean what you say and whatever structure you give them that's what you expect to see from them so they needed that stability and love Definitely. he said if you show them these three things you are going to see them excel and they did they did just that but I knew that it was more to it 
what these children was experiencing. And I knew that it was something that they had to be experiencing in the home. They had to be experiencing with their parents. Right. And I couldn't get deep as a teacher to that level. And so that's how God pulled me in to mental health. And I decided to go on and get my master's as in mental health counseling and became a mental health counselor. And I was in North Carolina at the time. That's how she was able to speak about North Carolina a and Yes, I'm a proud Aggie for those of you who are HBCU graduates on yeah, We're the largest HBCU in the country doing great things. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, God put that in my spirit. And so when I finished there, I decided to move to Atlanta and started out as a very young counselor working in addiction therapy. Okay. as well as working in mental health counseling. And that's where it all began for me. So I saw a lot, you all, at a very young age. I know you look at me now and say, oh, she's still young. Yeah, but I started out even younger, okay? Started out even younger. So I have seen a lot as it relates to mental health. Um, I've done a lot of different work in the mental health field. So there is just a wealth of knowledge that I have and just a huge heart for the mental health population. Yeah. So you'll be able to hear that as I go through some of this presentation. And I'm gonna stop periodically through to get some engagement from you all and to get some questions. And I'm gonna ask Ms. Payne to help me with that. As I go through the presentation, I'll stop after every couple of slides and we'll kind of see just where you all are and, and what you're grasping. But I'm really excited to speak to you all as many of you are faith leaders because this is a population that sometimes I feel like gets left out. And it is so important because of the work that many of you all do in ministry that you have to understand these signs and symptoms. And not only understand these signs and symptoms, but understand the resources that are out there that are available to you. And not just the resources, but the comfortable spaces that are out there for you where you can be who you are and open up and share about the concerns and the challenges that you all have had. And the reason I can speak from that is because I've been blessed. God has blessed me to be able to counsel some faith leaders. So I do understand just how important it is. God also blessed me to help certain individuals where they went on to become faith leaders. They went on to become pastors and ministers and have a mental health diagnosis. And they are doing phenomenal. I was looking at one this morning on Facebook and I just said, oh, he's going on to become a pastor. Look at how wonderful he's doing. Look at how well he's doing. My eyes just teared up. But it just lets us know the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's a part of his testimony that he gives when he does speak about me. He says, Dr. Izzard, she didn't see me as a person with a mental health disorder. She saw me as a child of the king. Right. She saw me as a child of the king. And she started to minister to my spirit so much so that it helped me to open up. And to break out of all of that, the depression, the PTSD, the anxiety. You know, of course, you still go through some of the challenges in coping. Right. But like he said, for the most part, the anointing that God has on her life. That's how she was able to connect to me. Yes. Yes. So I hope that you all are going to get a lot out of this on today. And like I said, I we are going to take some breaks, you know, in between so that we can hear from you and hear what you're going through. So do you want me to try to share my screen? Yes, Let's please. See. Let's see. Okay, it's saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Give me one second then. Okay. Make sure that uh, I have released anything that uh, would hinder you because I do not want that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. And if not, I can just go on through it if you can't get to it. But it's just, it's giving a message saying host disabled screen share. Give me one second. It's, it's, you'll see up in just a second. And uh, you should be good to go now. 
Okay, let me go back. There to you it. go. Yep, there it goes. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're so welcome. You all should be able to see. I'm going to click on slideshow so that you can see a better view. And we are going to go ahead and get started. So first, I want to help you understand exactly what secondary traumatic stress is, okay? So that you can have a good understanding of it. Secondary traumatic stress is a concept that is closely related to post-traumatic stress. And all that means is, is that secondary traumatic stress resembles PTSD, meaning some of the symptoms mimic those symptoms of PTSD, okay? But there is a difference between the two, and this is the difference. The difference between the two is that PTSD results from direct personal exposure to trauma. So that is the individual that actually witnessed a trauma being committed or happening around them, or they actually went through the traumatic experience themselves, okay? Now, what I want to emphasize here, too, when it comes to trauma is that trauma is different for every person, okay? So we can't always specifically label and say, well, this person went through trauma, but that, that wasn't trauma what that person went through, because we can't say how a person reacts and responds to something that happens in their life it can be very traumatic to them. And I'll use just a brief, small example. But my father tickled me. He was telling me a story, but after he completed that story, I realized just how traumatized my father was. Now, I always heard my mother say, you know, your father's afraid of mice. He's afraid of rats, you know? And I'd say, huh, daddy, <laughs> you know, a big man afraid of rats, afraid of mice? So. I asked him about, this was just recently, you all. I knew this for years, but never asked him the question, right? So I said, Daddy, I said, why are you afraid of mice and rats like that? And he said, yes, I do have a phobia toward mice and rats. He said, because when I was a little boy, when I was four years old in our home, our home became infested with rats and mice, he said. And my mother tried to do everything she could to get those mice and those rats out of our house. And she, he said, we bombed and we cleaned and we did this and we did that. He said, we even boarded up vents and, and all types of things to keep them out. He said, you know them things ate right through <laughs> the board and came in there to the house. And then he said, and one night I was in the bed sleep. He said, and several of those mice was in that bed with me. He said, I jumped out of that bed and I ran it there to my mama room and jumped in that bed with my mama. And I said, mama, I can't take it. I can't take it with these mice. He said, then both of us, we looked up and the mice, they were coming down the curtains. They were coming down the window. <laughs> say, mama, say, oh, that's it. We out of here. We got to move. This is it. We, got, we can't take this no more. I said, oh, daddy. I said, I am so sorry. I said, that had to be traumatizing as a little bitty boy. And you to wake up and they were in your bed. And then you see them coming down the curtain and you're just a child. He said, yes. He said, I can't stand to look at them now. He said, I'm 50 some years old. He said, if I see one, I'm taking off. I'm gone. So it's funny, y'all, but it's serious at the same time because that was so traumatic for him that it will cause him to almost have an anxiety attack if he sees one because of what he experienced in his childhood. This was childhood. Now, my dad, I'm on 60, but this was in his childhood. So that lets you know anytime a person is traumatized, based upon their experience, their response, you cannot dare say that this was not traumatic for this person because it's how they respond to it, okay? So again, witnessed or actually experienced the trauma themselves. That's how an individual develops PTSD, okay? But then when you have secondary trauma, this comes from professionals, 
faith leaders, caregivers, who have actually worked with people who have been traumatized, okay? Whether they counsel them, whether they serve them and they were just talking to them or trying to comfort them and they were sharing about what they have gone through or what they went through. Literally, all you have to do is hear the stories, secondary, okay? Now what we're experiencing with the pandemic and the racial inequality and injustice, you all, the videos that we have seen on the national news with individuals dying and being shot dead in the streets, that is secondary. But when you think about it, if you look at the definition of PTSD and how you develop it, it's a witness. Witness, right, right, right. So just you seeing the video, and especially if you keep looking at it over and over again every week, because they do show them every week, you keep looking at it, that then puts you at risk of developing PTSD or secondary traumatic stress. We are seeing so much trauma in our world now. And like I said, now poor our babies, our children, the children are seeing stuff that no other generation has ever seen. All of the, the massive shootings that they were seeing in the schools even before, then seeing stuff on the news, on the media, hearing about it. But not only that, because the schools wanted to protect the kids, now they had massive shooting drills. Right. Think about that. Most young generation, they had tornado drills. But this generation, now they have mass shooting drills. You all, that in itself can cause secondary traumatic stress. Just the thought of you having to prepare just in case a person comes in there and tries to shoot all of you dead children. So you all, we are living in a world now in these times and we are people of strong faith. We understand what these times are. We know what they are. But, but we have to be even more cautious because we are the generation that is living in these times. So we have to do the necessary work to protect our minds, to protect our spirits, I was just telling Ms. Payne, I said, on the weekends, I detach. I don't look at the news. And I'm going to tell you, I love CNN. You know, it's right here in Atlanta. I love CNN now, you know. But I intentionally detach from it for three days to give my mind time to breathe and at peace and just enjoy my meditation time with God, letting him talk to me and speak to me through those three days without any distractions from what's going on around us, for my self-care. I'm a licensed counselor. I work with people every day. I have to be strong mentally. I have to renew my mind every single day. So I cannot put myself in positions where I increase my risk even higher for PTSD or secondary traumatic stress, okay? And just to give you a little bit more insight, it says here, it says for therapists, child welfare workers, case managers, faith leaders, other helping professionals involved in the care of traumatized children and adults, the essential act of just listening to the traumatic stories may take an emotional toll that compromises professional functioning. That's what you got to get right here. So not only is it affecting you personally, okay, and I'm gonna get to that in a little bit, but not only is it affecting you personally, but it will affect you in your professional work. It's gonna come out right. some kind of a way. Now, never forget, I had a colleague experiencing, she was experiencing a little bit of burnout and secondary traumatic stress. And I will never forget, she told me this story. She said, it's, it's something wrong with me. I got to go to the doctor. I got to go to the doctor and, and get myself checked out and see what's going on, see what's wrong with me. 
So she goes to the doctor, go to the medical doctor now. Licensed counselor too now. She goes to the medical doctor, tell the medical doctor the, symptom, the physical symptoms she's having. That doctor looked at her, that doctor said, ma'am, you are under stress. He <laughs> said, what kind of work are you doing? So she told him, you know, I'm a counselor in a mental health clinic. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. He said, and what are you doing for you? She was in school at the same time. Just, just spread too thin all over the place. He said, ma'am, it's nothing wrong with you. She said, well, what about um, my bowels? You know, I, I can't hold my bowels. I, I think I got irritable bowel syndrome. He said, oh, yeah, you do have R. You, you do have R. Yes, you have it. He said, but it's as a result of your stress. He said, if you decrease your stress and you get rid of that stress, you'll get rid of the irritable bowel syndrome. So when she came back to me and told me all of that, I said, I think I've already told you that. I said, but I don't know what it's going to take for you to understand that you have to take care of yourself. You cannot operate as a counselor and try to do all these other things and think that you're not going to be affected mentally and spiritually. Oh, I left that part out. Oh, yeah, she has a master's in uh, divinity and she's been an associate uh, pastor before. So I left that part out, sorry. <laughs> so I said, um, when you get ready, you're going to have to learn how to put yourself first and how to set some boundaries mm -hmm. so that you're not affected. Because it was affecting her in her work. It was starting to affect her passion for the population that we were working mm -hmm. with. So much so that she came into our front office one day. And this is an area where still our clients could come back and forth. But thank God none of the clients were back there that day. And she said, I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of them giving me all the cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I said, oh. Your passion. So it affects what you do in your work. It affects when you're trying to engage with your congregation, with your members. It affects those that you're ministering to. It affects those that you're trying to heal. It's going to come out some kind of way the longer you don't do anything about it or you don't do the right thing. And this next part here is so critical. That's why I have it in bold. It will diminish your quality of life. It will diminish your quality of life. That means you will no longer even be able to enjoy your life, the blessed days that God has given you. Because we know that we can't take any day for granted. But because you're experiencing secondary traumatic stress or burnout or PTSD, you're experiencing all these things, not doing anything about it, not getting any counseling, not getting any intervention. Now your quality of life is out the door. Most of those people, they can't even feel positivity. They can't even be optimistic. They can't even feel joy. Feel their faith anymore. And you all, I've heard it. I've heard them say it. I don't feel that God is with me. I don't feel God here. I've mm -hmm. been going through this for this amount of years and so on, so on, so on, so When have you decided to take care of you and follow these principles that many of us know? We can recite them in our sleep. Biblical principles. Biblical tools, when are you going to put them to use and speak to a professional that can help you structure those biblical principles and tools and interventions and teach you how to apply them on a daily basis? Okay, I'm going to stop right there, Ms. Payne, and see if we have any comments or any questions or anything. So definitely, as you as you're watching and listening and absorbing, please be sure to share your questions or comments right here um, in the thread here 
uh, one thing is, is um, right now, I don't have any right now, but I'm allowing people the moment to, to type it because I, I definitely know that there, there's, you, you shared a lot. And, and one thing that you said, well, I, I, can, I can attest to a few things you said on here on, on several different levels, some things people have shared with me and my own personal experience. I'll start with, as we're waiting on uh, others who may have questions or comments, we welcome you to type them in. Thank you all for joining, who have joined on. Blessings to you all. One thing you said, I just experienced. Now, not to say that this is my first time experiencing this, but this is the most recent. Um, last Friday, so this has been not, not day before yesterday, but a week ago Friday. Between that Friday and this Friday, so seven days, I um, received phone calls of people who were at at, now, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm just an advocate trying to make a difference. I am a, I am a licensed coach, but I'm not a mental health coach. And here's the thing. These people trusted me from various walks of life. One, one, is, a, one is an evangelist, one is just different, different people. So I'm getting these calls of people who are going through some serious stuff and in each, each call, I referred them to a professional. But after each call, I felt as though I was wearing cement shoulder pads. So what I found myself doing is the very thing that you and I talked about on the phone. And that is, I had to find, get back and to remember what it is that made me get to that place of peace. So I went outside of my patio. I went outside and got some fresh air, got some, some good old sunlight. Did, you know, start doing things that, that put me back in a place of peace and start, you know, and I, and I literally felt, different, felt better, literally, literally felt better. But I, while I was standing out there, I began to think about people like yourself, people who are licensed professionals, who they don't just get one or two phone calls or, or in my case, four different phone calls in a week's time. Yo, you all have patient after patient, client after client, person after person, not mm -hmm. to mention, not to mention, I'm certain family members or, and colleagues and friends who come to you. Mm -hmm. So I began to think about that as I was walking out there and I, I was walking out and I did, and I remember you got to remember to take care of yourself because here's what happened. And when you told the story just now, it kind of made me tickle because uh, the beginning of the year, I went, what was this, January? It was January, February. I went to the doctor because I was like, listen, something is wrong with me. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. I had, I had a, just a whole list of things went to my medical doctor for. She said, you have insomnia. I said, now what now? I said, but, but I told you that I was having pain in my back and my neck. Uh-huh. <laughs> so she, mm -hmm. she said, um, I said, oh goodness, there was a whole list of things. And she was saying what the interesting part of it was, she she named some things that I hadn't even said to her, but they were things that I was experiencing. I forgot I had even forgot to even list them down, but they were things that I was I was dealing with. And I was like, oh my goodness, yeah, that that too. She told me something that if I hadn't been sitting on the little table, it would have floored me. She said, I can tell you this and I know all this because although I'm a medical doctor, I know what it's like because I experienced it myself. And I appreciated okay. her and her okay. honesty. And I appreciated that because as you said, those who serve, they also go through the same things. They have things that they experience and that they you know, they had, and she herself said she had to change her diet. She had to realize that she had to start doing things, start winding down. Like you said, stop watching TV, stop watching the news. Not, to, she didn't say TV. She said she stopped watching, watching the news at a certain time because she knew that if she carried that with her, then she wouldn't be able to, that was just going to mess up the sleep even more. And, but and the last thing, so those, those are two things that you said that just resonated with me. But the third thing that when you were talking resonated with me is I, um, on, on a couple of different uh, occasions, actually three that come to mind and maybe more, but three come to mind, three separate occasions where I've been in, in a forum where there were pastors, two of, two of which I was um, on the panel 
to kind of speak about pain in the pews um, and how it's okay for pastors to get help and all this fun stuff. Um, but one thing I remember um, is one that um, I was sitting in on. Uh, actually, I, I wasn't uh, I was a speaker. I actually was the um, the MC. And one of the pastors stood up and said, "Who do we go to when we're hurting?" He said, "If we say something over the pulpit, we're accused of bleeding on the sheep. Mm -hmm. If we say something to our to our colleagues, where we don't know who to trust." We don't know who, 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 who's going to come back and turn it around and, and, and slap it back in our face. We don't know who to trust, even though they're wearing a collar. We don't, we don't want to bring it home to our spouses. They already see us. We have to wear the S on our chest so much that they, they have blurred the line between wearing the S on their chest and just being who they are. Many of them have pre-existing diagnoses or mm -hmm. undiagnosed yes, um, from PTSD, as you, as you explained earlier. And the gentleman, he was so passionate about what he was saying. He had to stand up. He was standing there saying, who do we talk to? Who do we go to? Now, thankfully, in that particular setting, he was in a room filled with, with mental health professionals. <laughs> and so there were people who were there who were able to give him business cards, to give them business cards. So specifically, it started out with him. But that was in that setting. That was a room full of maybe 35, 40 people, right? Mm -hmm. But what about the ones that week after week are standing in their pulpits or in their, at this particular moment, you know, maybe, you know, stand, standing behind their, their laptop or behind their smartphone and they're ministering or doing the best they can to minister, but they've got, they've got the challenge of not being able to, if, if, a, if a church member does pass away, not being able to have services as we normally would, mm -hmm. not being able to comfort, <clears throat> excuse me, the family as they normally would, dealing with the trauma of, of not being able to, as you, as you said, just kind of have that quality of life that they, that they need because there, there are so many stigmas as it pertains to mental health. Mm -hmm. I'm the preacher. I can't have a mental health condition. And God, you know, I, I'm God's chosen. I'm God's mm -hmm. called. I'm God. I, and we put everything on God. But, but it, you know, if they look in the scripture, they'll see that there are several prophets. There were several men of God that were used of God that had mental health challenges. If you just look and see the right. challenges. But we put so, so such we, we put such a demand on the stigma that we forget that there is a there's a quality of life that's missing. So they don't get to settle their word like they normally would. They don't get to, 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 to deposit as they normally would because what now they're now depositing is tainted, for lack of a better term for me to use right now, because they're weighed down with all this other stuff that they've not dealt with. I see it. Yes, ma'am. You said it. You said it. Did we get any comments to come in? No, I just, I saw some, so I saw emojis go up. I haven't seen any comments. I've just seen oh, some like, I haven't seen some likes and hearts. So, um, but yes, yeah, as we're going on guys, if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free. We are so glad that you've joined in. We are loving this opportunity to have, to have this conversation with you. I'm monitoring Facebook for Dr. Izzy and, um, you guys just keep on, keep on enjoying and uh, absorbing. And, That's what it is. They're absorbing. <laughs> absolutely, I can tell. Yes, well, I did see some, some, uh, some lights and some hearts going up a moment ago. But right now, let me make sure. Nope, no questions right now. Okay, that's fine. We're gonna keep it moving. Yeah. But something you said too, Miss Pena, really, really stood out as it relates to understanding again. You know where these faith leaders are. And I know that it can be even more challenging for faith leaders because they're not only faith leaders, they're community leaders right? You know, right. as well. And so they are more in a public eye or public view. Even yeah. though counselors, you know, health professionals, we, we go through it too, you know, with some of the stigma and getting help. But you'll always hear me say that every counselor needs their own counselor. Yes, ma'am. 
but also every minister and every pastor needs their own counsel. Yeah. And so I think that's the piece where we have to go to God and have to talk to God about leading us as it relates to who I'm going to speak with at the professional level and allowing God to just do that leading, that unctioning in your spirit, but knowing that it's a must, that you have to do it in order to have the balance that you need and in order to be able to release the way that you need and to be able to have that true safe space that you need. So faith leaders struggle with it, professional counselors struggle with it, and the military population oh, yeah. struggles with oh, it. Yeah. Now I work a lot with veterans, United States veterans, you all, the majority of my population were men. You know, they were African-American men, about 80% African-American men, about 20% Caucasian-American men. But all of them really struggled with that stigma piece because of their culture in the military, things that they heard, things that they saw. So they reverted to drinking alcohol or, you know, acting out, doing whatever to keep from going to get the necessary help that they needed, but that is so dangerous yeah. because what happens to many of them that choose not to get the help and get what they need, they become suicidal. Yeah. That is what is the end result. And so it's not just that the military population can be at risk of that. Anybody who is not taking care of their mental health can be at risk of suicidal ideation. That's the thinking before you even get to the actual act. But you are just in depression. When you get the hopelessness and helplessness, what comes next in the signs and symptoms of depression is suicidal ideation. So it lets you know that we have to just be very cognizant of where we are mentally. But see, if we're already doing the work in advance, if we're already getting the self-care and doing what we're supposed to do on a day in and day out basis, on a weekly basis, whether you see in your counselor every two weeks, every two months, whatever you decide, if you're doing the work already, then that doesn't put you at great risk because you're doing the resilience work. You're doing the self-care work. But it's when you don't do it, it's when you put yourself at high risk and in dangerous situations. So moving along, I wanted to talk a little bit about purpose because I know that this piece is so important when it comes to faith leaders and when it comes to counselors. We understand that our professions, that they are purpose driven, okay? And we want to make sure that we are purpose driven that we are in the right place, on the right assignment, in his will, doing what he's asked us to do. But many times when we're working toward that and making sure that we stay in line with purpose, that's then where we many times cause ourselves to do more than we should, okay? We can go what I call just too far overboard of what we are supposed to be doing, where we get to a point to where we have no balance, none at all. And then you are putting yourself again at risk, all in the name of, well, this is my purpose. Mm. This is my service. I have to do this. This is for the people of God. But God always wants us to use wisdom. Wisdom in what he has called us to do. And when you feel as though you are at that point and you don't really know if you've taken on too much, then we need to go to him and we need to ask. 
because what I know for sure is that we don't want to put ourselves in a place to where our health is at risk. Right. Okay. So it goes on to say, be a problem solver, not a problem maker. And what that means is whether you're a counselor or a faith leader, you out there solving problems. You are. But then don't be a problem maker by causing yourself to have health, more health challenges and health issues, health problems. <laughs> then how are you to be an example and a role model for those that you are helping and that you are serving when the next thing they know you in the hospital? Why are you in the hospital, Pastor? Why are you in the hospital, Minister? Why are you in the hospital, Counselor? Effective leaders know in order to be a great leader, you must become a great server. That's true. And we are servant leaders. But you can't get so consumed in your service that you forget about you. It goes back to the airplane oxygen support that I always like to share in this presentation. When you are on that airplane, they tell you, if an emergency happens, put the oxygen on yourself first. Who are you going to save if you go? Who? You have to put the oxygen on yourself first before you try to help anyone else. It's not being selfish. It's understanding the law of self-preservation. If you don't take care of yourself, your body will eventually tell you you're not. And your body will give out. Or your heart will give out. Oh, we had a close family member, close, close, close. My mother's best, best friend in the whole wide world. She was friends with him from the time she was a teenager. Mm. He was in the military, went in the military and served his country and came out with some challenges. Yeah, he had PTSD and some other things going on too. But he didn't take care of himself, you all. And he was a person that served. Oh, you're talking about a, just a beautiful heart. I mean, anything he had that he could give, he would give it. I mean, he would let people live with him, stay with him. He had three, he has three beautiful girls and they had children. He would take care of them and take care of their children. Oh, I mean, he would run. You all, you're talking about that man would run. And I mean, literally you all, he ran until the day he left here. When they found him, he was in the car and had a heart attack. Had the heart attack medicine in his hand. Didn't even get a chance to take the medicine. Wow. He had been doing that all his life to the point it wore his heart down. His heart was so weakened. He had open heart surgery, had stents put in. And they had let him know then, you got to be careful. You got to stop this. You got to take care of yourself. You can't keep doing all this. You can't keep running. Yeah, we know you want to serve. I mean, I'm talking about serve. I mean, served our commit. Everybody knew him. Everybody. But you all, you can't forget about you. If you do not take care of you and do the work, you will not be here. You won't be here. There will be an untimely death because your poor body and heart and mind just can't take it. The closer we get to God, the more he can teach us how to manage the problems in life. And we use the wisdom of God to ask for help. So that means as it relates to your balance, as it relates to you learning how to take care of yourself, as it relates to you going to therapy, 
Talk to God about this so that you can get it right now. There's no more time to waste. You must get it right now, today. Start today putting the focus and the self-care on you. Okay. Did anything come up, Ms. Payne, before I keep yes, moving? Yes, ma'am. A lot, a lot of hearts. No questions. Just um, a lot of likes. I, um, the self-care piece from Rosemary Graham. She definitely liked the self-care piece. Elder Michelle Johnson said, this is good. Um, I've been seeing, <laughs> yes, ma'am. I've been seeing the heart emojis go up. So yes, ma'am, I, I definitely, it is, it is, like you said, they're absorbing it in and taking it, taking it in. Thank you all who are tuned in and watching. We appreciate you so much. Really do appreciate you. And yes, indeed, self-care is so important. Whatever right. that looks like to you, it's important. Yeah, it's important. So we're gonna go about ten more minutes, y'all, and we're gonna get some engagement going in. But let me get over, get through some more of these important things. So, I really want you to see the symptoms because. You need to be able to see for yourself and self-assess, and I'll talk a little bit about that too, how you can identify if you have STS. But I wanted you to be able to see these symptoms so that you can identify if you've already experienced some of these symptoms, okay? And if you have, go ahead and put them in the comments so that Ms. Payne can monitor and know who has actually experienced some of these symptoms, okay? So I'm just gonna call them out. Hypervigilance, okay? Now what hypervigilance is, it's a startle response. What that means is the least little thing can cause you to get on edge, you get jumpy, okay? You get afraid, you know, real easily about certain things, whether it's related to the population you work with, whether it's related to the trauma stories, specific stories that you heard about, whether it's with children, whether it's with adults, whatever the case may be, if you hear something about it, if a sound reminds you of it, if you see it, the least little thing can cause you to become jumpy, cause you to, to become startled, okay? That's hypervigilance. Hopelessness. That means you get to the place, you get to the point to where you just feel like there's no way out. Or you just feel like, I just don't know what else I can do. I don't even know if I'm doing enough anymore in this field or in this position or as this professional working with these members of these people. I just don't know anymore. I just don't even know if what I'm doing is even helping. Okay, That's hopelessness. No way out. Inability to embrace complexity, okay? That means when you are faced with challenges, you are faced with uh, different situations. And we know as counselors and as faith leaders, we get this all the time, you know, with the people we work with. So anytime you feel as though it gets to be too much for you, it gets to be so overwhelming for you, you're just like, oh, I can't, oh, it's too much. You know, kind of like what Miss Payne said, how she felt so weighed down after all of those individuals had called her, was telling her all of those things, and she felt all of their problems. And many of us who are strong in faith, we have a strong spirit of discernment, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And when you have a strong spirit of discernment, that means you are able to discern spirit, mm -hmm. okay? And so anytime you are hearing about these things, you're not just hearing about it but you're discerning the spirit mm. that's connected to it, mm -hmm. okay? So when you get to a place and you feel like you can no longer manage that, you don't know what to do in order to manage it, whether it's you need to fast, whether it you need to go into your prayer closet for, you know, 30 minutes or 20 minutes, whether you need to listen to uh, your Bible study for a period of time, whether you need to go in and you need to affirm by confessing your word over and over to renew your mind, all these different things. When you just get to the place where you feel like you don't know what to do, or you just don't feel like doing anything, that's the inability to embrace complexity. You done lost it. You, you, you lost that ability, okay, to understand how you balance when you got all that coming at you, okay? The inability to listen, okay? Absolutely. You completely shut down. You just block it out. The members come to you. You know, the clients come to you. 
and they talking to you and they tell you ain't heard nothing they say. You see their lips moving and you ain't heard nothing they say. And it's like, whoo, it's almost lunchtime. When they gonna get out of here? <laughs> you block it out because your brain gets to a point to where it just don't, it can't take no more. Avoidance of clients or members, individuals you're helping. You don't even really want to be around. Now you might do it because you know that's your position and you know you there. But in your heart and in your mind, it's like, <sighs> I got to go to this again today. I got to go to this outreach event. I got to go and do this. I got to go and do this. Oh my goodness. You want to avoid. And anything that reminds you of what has given you that startle response or what has given you that feeling related to that trauma, anything that reminds you of it, you don't want nothing to do with it. Nothing. Okay. Anger or cynicism. You get angry all of a sudden and you don't even know why. You become cynical and you don't even know why. Sleeplessness, this is huge. Tossing and turning, tossing and turning. Difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep. You wake up or you lay down and you say, oh, okay, I feel like I've been asleep for eight hours. You went to bed at 10 o'clock, you wake up, it's 1030. 30 minutes you've been asleep. Sleeplessness. And all do your body need sleep. Chronic exhaustion. This is when you done slept eight hours. And you wake up and you feel dog tired. And you can wake up with a splitting headache. And you'll be like, what? And why am I feeling like this? I went to bed. I went to sleep. I went to bed early. Chronic exhaustion. You've been exhausted over time. That you don't get rest. You sleeping, but you're not resting. Not resting too much on your mind, too much on your heart. You haven't released. You're not managing. You're not coping. You're not taking care of yourself. And then the physical ailments. Mm -hmm. You're not sleeping. You jumpy. You're all over the place. All these different things going on quite naturally. Your body is going to feel it. You're going to have aching joints, back pain, neck pain, all these different things going on. And then again, you run into the medical doctor. Oh, I'm in pain. <laughs> all because you're not taking care of you. And then minimizing guilt. That's a big one. Because many times in the fields that we're in, we already know how much we care about people and how much we have a heart for people. But when you're experiencing secondary traumatic stress, you kind of get the mindset of, oh, you know, it is what it is. You know, whatever. I did the best that I could. So you minimize that guilt feeling, even though you know deep down inside, you're not taking care of people like you should. Okay. So those are the symptoms. So y'all put in the comments some of the, these symptoms that you have experienced. Okay. Hypervigilance, startle response, hopelessness, inability to embrace complexity, inability to listen, avoidance, okay, of clients, of members, anger, sleeplessness, chronic exhaustion, physical ailments, and minimizing guilt. Okay. Do we have any? No, they're pretty quiet on here right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they're, they're taking okay. it in, but they're, they're, it's actually pretty quiet on, on here, unless they're still typing, but it's pretty, okay. pretty quiet. But um, I was looking just to make sure that I didn't miss um, anyone. But yes, yeah, they're, they're pretty quiet right now. Other okay. than, than the hearts I saw go up, but uh, pretty quiet. <laughs> okay, well, five more minutes when we get to engagement. I want to get to the therapy um, part first. Okay. And talk a little bit about prevention and intervention. So 
for you all that have heard these symptoms and you understand for yourself, whether you put it in a chat or not, but you're feeling that, yes, I've experienced some of this. Yes, I'm at that place that I haven't been taking care of myself. I haven't been balancing, haven't been doing what I'm supposed to do. What do I need to do to find out more about this? Okay. Take self-assessments. Okay. There is a secondary traumatic stress assessment that you can take. Okay. If you all are in need of it, just let Ms. Payne know. She can send you the information, but it's on Google. You can Google it, but the one that I use is from NADAC, which is N-A-A-D-A-C. It's an addiction organization, okay? But it is an actual self-assessment that you can take that has a variety of questions on it that will help you identify if you actually are experiencing secondary traumatic stress, okay? Then we already talked about this, how essential this is. You must apply self-care, okay? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about different types of self-care. Counseling, career counseling, coaching, whatever you need, whatever form of counseling you need, it is important that you seek this professional help, okay? So that you can truly balance and learn how to cope with the profession that you're really in, okay? Staying committed to your faith. Yes, understanding your spiritual principles that help you, that work for you, okay? Fasting, praying, tithing, fellowshipping. It's so important that you keep up with this, going to Bible study, okay? You know, most of our stuff is virtual now, so it's just a click of the button, you know, for us to go back and replay Bible study over again, go back and replay Sunday service over again. We can get the word in seven days a week. We can go and visit other churches and don't even have to drive now. We can just go on YouTube, go on Facebook and visit all different churches around Atlanta. So we don't have any excuse, you all. We can get the word in but you have to be intentional about it. And you have to understand how much of it you need, okay? Everybody is a little different. So you're not expected to do what the next person does. While I may spend two hours in my quiet time a day, you may not be at that level. It may be in increments, you know, 15 minutes every four hours, you know, that you're able to spend with God or 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, whatever works for you, okay? but you must be consistent. Praying in the spirit, okay? We understand as people of faith, okay? That there are individuals that have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one of the most blessed things you can do for yourself is consistent prayer in the spirit. The Holy Spirit is living water. It comes to cleanse you. Okay, it comes to comfort you. It comes to guide you. Utilize the power in which the almighty God has given you. Okay, when we pray in the spirit, this is what happens in the spirit realm. We pray the perfect prayer. We give perfect praise. We have perfect intercession and we release the mysteries of the almighty God. That right there is a sermon within itself. <laughs> yes, indeed. But you must be consistent. Consistent with it, okay? And then there are some individuals that may need to change their work setting. It doesn't mean change your work field or change your career, but you may need to change the setting. You may need to move to a different location. You may need a change, a fresh start, a renewal, okay? But these are some prevention and intervention tactics, okay? Resilience building, that also helps you to deal with if you have secondary traumatic stress. These are just some areas, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but some of them are really critical, okay? Such as not seeing a crisis as a surmountable problem, in such a way that it can't be managed or we can't deal with it. I think so many people 
see the pandemic and they see what's going on right now with the racial injustice. And it seems like it's just so huge that they don't know how they can manage or how they can cope. That's why they're so anxious, anxious to try to get back to life, to what they know is normal, rather than accepting that we're going to have a new normal, okay? And it's going to look there, it's already, it already looks very different. But being able to accept that and understanding that as a person of faith, I serve someone that's greater, okay? I have a greater solution. I can lay my burdens down, okay? But I can also do that in the company of a licensed professional that has a strong faith basis like me as well, that can help to guide me, okay? Making connections. This is very important. Connecting with the right people, having the right fellowship, okay? When it comes to being a faith leader and a minister, you can't hang out with everybody. Right. Councils, we can't hang out with everybody. Everybody can't be our peers, okay? We have to be very selective and discerning in the circles that we keep because that can cause you stress within itself if you don't have the right people in your circle the right support system, okay? And then another good one on here I like is taking decisive actions, meaning making the right choices and the right decisions in the different areas of our life. Again, being led, you gotta be led, you have to discern so that you can make those right decisions for yourself, which goes right in line with making the decision to see a professional counselor, to apply self-care tools, okay? <laughs> so hopefully you were able to get some of those, but that's resilience building. That's how we build ourselves back up, okay? I'm gonna get to, yes, get here and then I'll talk about the different faith. So this beautiful woman here is named Lily Bell Izzard. This is my maternal, my late maternal grandmother. Now my grandmother is what I consider to be the most amazing servant leader that I have ever known. My grandmother lost her mother when her mother was 40 years of age. So my grandmother was the oldest daughter. And so she was left with the responsibility to help raise her siblings. Okay. And my grandmother had seven siblings. Then my grandmother started having her own children while she was very young. And my grandmother ended up having nine children. Seven of them survived. I mean, but two of them did not. But she raised her seven children. Then my grandmother loved other people's children. So in her community, in her neighborhood, if there were women who were struggling and didn't understand how to mother their children, she took on the responsibility of raising their children as well. Then my grandmother was a server in the type of work that she did. She worked in hotel work doing housekeeping. She also served as a maid for several white families, serving. My mother also took care of the mentally handicapped. My grandmother also took care of the mentally handicapped. So she served those individuals. Then my grandmother helped to found her church. She was always very active in her church, very involved in serving and ministry. All my grandmother knew was serving. But while my grandmother did all of that serving, she never understood how to take care of herself at the same time of serving all of these others. And as a result, my grandmother's health suffered greatly. And we lost my grandmother at the tender age of 68 years old. So that is why this topic 
is so important to me to share with individuals because I have vowed as her first grandchild, as her seed, to help other servant leaders understand, yes, what we do is essential, it's important. But if you don't learn how to take care of yourself, you will not live a long life. Where you may have impacted many, you will not get the opportunity to enjoy your golden years. So it is important and essential that we understand self-care first and balance and continue to let God lead us in servant leadership. And just wanted to share a little bit about therapy. One of the most evidence-based practices used is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's used pretty much any mental health facility you go into, CBT is being utilized, okay? So because it is so essential, it's evidence-based, it's research-based, I was able to integrate cognitive behavioral therapy with biblical principle and biblical scripture, which is how I came up with faith inspiration therapy. I used this therapy working with United States veterans that had a Christian faith background that struggled with PTSD, anger issues, depression, and anxiety. And many of them that I serve will tell you to this day, it was so effective for them. By the time the treatment be finished, they were traveling. Many of them that were single, they were dating again. I said, oh, I think it's a little too soon for you to be dating again. But they were feeling better and feeling good because they were applying these tools and these interventions consistently. Remember that word, consistently. You can't start and stop. You have to be consistent. So that is my treatment approach. And like I said, it is integrated with faith in, I mean, with CBT, which is evidence-based practice, but self-care therapy, you all, you must have it in order to cope and manage and be able to overcome secondary traumatic stress, okay? So I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation on tonight. Here is my contact information. And now we are going to start some discussion. Let's get a little bit of engagement from you all because you have been so quiet. Very but, quiet. <laughs> but I do hope that you have received a great deal. Please put into the comments so that Ms. Payne can see if this was essential for you and effective for you. Absolutely. And as you're watching, as, as the slide is still up there, go ahead and screenshot so that you already have um, her information. You can just screenshot there so that you can um, have um, her email address and how you can connect with her on Facebook, as well as her website as well. So go ahead and it, um, if you're joining from your laptop, go ahead and hit print screen or um, screenshot from your, um, from your phone so that you'll have it right there in front of you. And again, um, if you have any comments or we, if this has been a blessing for you, we definitely want to hear from you. I see, um, I can tell um, just from looking at the analytics on here that over 161 people are engaged and there, are, uh, there aren't as many people who are on live with us, but you know how Facebook can do. You can actually mm -hmm. look at the video without coming into the room, but there are over 161 people who actually <laughs> engaged so that is that is a pretty that is pretty awesome. So I'm glad even if even for those who are kind of um, shy about making comments, especially on on this particular to topic and comment uh, uh, context, I get it. I totally get it. But I I'm hoping that even in that that you're hearing something and you can apply it, and that the things that Dr. Izzy went over when she went down the list of the symptoms. And if you saw yourself in any of those, don't it, it doesn't even have to be right now. You may not, 
have it, be experiencing them right now, but have you? Have you experienced those at any time? Do, can, can you identify with some of those things? I know I could, the very first one, the very first one I could identify with because I'll, I'll start jumping in a minute. <laughs> but I know why. I know why and I know what I need to do. One of the things that she talked about was coping skills and she talked about self-care. I, I know what I need to do in order to, to, help my, to help myself. This is the only me I have. This is the only me. My, my children may look like me, but that they're not me. This is the only one I have. So I've got to take care of me. So um, those that are on, feel I would, we would love to hear your comments. Or as, as we've seen in the past, if you want to send me um, messages via inbox um, now or, or after, we totally re receive those as well. But I'm telling you, Dr. Izzy, you said a lot that really we needed, we as a, as a community, we need. And let me clarify what I mean by community. Obviously, the African-American community, we needed all of this because we're, we're, the PTSD that you talked about, the trauma that you talked about, what we're seeing over and over, we're being into, inundated daily. But in the faith community, you said something earlier, and I put it here in the comments, when you said sometimes the faith leaders get overlooked. Mm -hmm. They get overlooked because, you know, they're, they're the faith leaders. They're supposed to be the strong ones. <laughs> but but I, I think that, that now would be a good time for me to show my shirt that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. So I'm going to show you guys what my shirt says. And it says, hashtag therapy is for the culture. Mm-hmm. I do not own this. This is not one of my shirts, but, but I own this shirt. But therapy is for the culture. Therapy is for you. There is no, there is no particular group of people who is more susceptible or more prone or more apt to get therapy than the other. There is no group of people who, who therapy is for because therapy is for everyone. And listen, at this particular moment in, in history, because we, we are literally in the midst right now of history. We are sitting smack dab in the middle of history. This will be talked about for, with our grandchildren, great grandchildren. This is something that's gonna be talked about. We are in the middle of history at this very moment. Mm -hmm. That's right. And how, how will it read? Do we, how, do we, how do we handle it? Will we be one of the ones that's on a slide that, I, that our that our grandchildren talk about? Or will we be here to hear our grandchildren talk about it? Will we take care of ourselves to the point where we'll be able to, to be able to sit back and see that's my granddaughter, that's my grandson that's doing that, that's saying that, that that I that that listen to what I the example that I showed them? Or will you be one of the ones that is spoken well of in a slide? because you're not here to reap the benefits. That's good, that's good right there. And so, and it's important to understand what self-care really is. Yes. Because some individuals- I wrote that down, I'm glad you said that. I wrote that down for you to- Yeah, they, under, they hear the word self-care. They know of some things that they can do, such as right. resting and, you know, taking time off and things of that nature. But there are other things that you can do to make it more consistent. Now, when you do go and see a counselor, you all, I'm just going to tell you, they really help you with that. You know, they really help you to break down what self-care is effective for you, because not all of the self-care is the same and is effective for everyone. So you have to understand what really works for you. And so whether that is different types of meditation, there's mindfulness meditation and all of this, you are, it, faith can be integrated. I integrate faith with all of these interventions all the time. And I know they work because I use them for myself. I use them. So right. I know that they work and I know how to integrate faith, biblical scripture, biblical principle into these evidence-based practices for anxiety, for depression, for, you know, anger related issues, you know, for traumatic stress, you know, all of these, but you have essential oils, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, you know, I don't think those oils work. Well, have you tried? 
Right. No. Did you try? try? <laughs> yeah. Did, did you put it in an actual diffuser and let it go all night? Okay. Did you try when you was meditating? Did you inhale it when you were sleeping? Did you put some in your hand and inhale it and see right. how it makes you feel? You know, right. you have to give it a try so that you can see if it's effective for you. And yes, essential oils do work. They yeah. can work on your body. They also work you inhaling them. Now I had to go through a process. I had to learn it too. I had to learn all these things too. But when you learn them, you keep applying it. You Absolutely. stay consistent. Absolutely. And there are different types of essential oils for different areas that we're struggling with. There are oils that keep you centered. There are oils that, you know, keep your skin beautiful. There are oils that, you know, have a calming nature in it. And again, when we think about the almighty God and nature and what he's created for us, they come from nature, they come from plants, you know, been here for years and many individuals just have not been using them. Water, for me, just hearing the sound of water yeah. is soothing and calming to me. I was just telling Miss Payne before I had got on, I was out doing my exercise and that's another self-care tool for those of you that like exercise, not for everybody. But I was out doing me a good jog, a good run. And I told Miss Payne, I said, it started to get dark all of a sudden. I said, ooh, I said, we can already get some rain. I said, well, let me just get on in the car. So I'm not going to go anywhere because usually I sit out and I read my book usually when it's pretty and the sun is out. So I said, I'll just sit in the car and read my book until, you know, the rain stops. So I figured, so we're just going to get a little rain about five or 10 minutes, you know, then it'll stop. That wind started picking up. And I started to feel my car a little bit tilt. Now, I don't have no little car. So my car started to tilt. And I said, what in the world, God? I said, this is unusual here now with the weather. I said, this is a little bit more than a little rain that's coming. So I went on, I kept reading my book and the rain started coming down and it was, shh, you know, then all of a sudden it got loud. You are, I said, oh, is that noise? I said, this can't just be hard rain. And I said, well, let me try to look a little bit closer outside. You all, that was hell. I mean, lots of hell was coming down. I'm in Newton County. It was so full that it was all over the street, all over the grass. I mean, it looked like snow, like we had just had a, a, a quick snow. And I said, oh my goodness, it was so loud to the point that I had to close my ears. And all I could do was say, God, I know there are things you're not pleased with. I said, God, just, just, just be here. Just just understand that there are so many of us that love you and we're doing everything that we can to live our life right and do it the right way. I said, God, I'm here. I love you. I love you. I love you. I said, God, please. I know you're hurting. I said, but please, God, I can't take this loud noise. I can't take this hell in this car. I said, please, God, just, just calm it down just enough for me to get home, just enough for me to get home. And it eventually, it, it, it calmed on down probably about two minutes after that. And I, just to be sure, I walked over. It was a YMCA close to me. So I said, well, let me go in here and just stand for a few minutes just in case it starts back. And you all, you should have heard them. They said, oh, we ain't never seen nothing like this either before. Oh, it just came out of nowhere. Oh, it was so loud. They all said the same thing, you all. So we have got to be cognizant, mindful of nature, okay? mindful of God's hand moving in nature, being grateful for when we have these beautiful sunny days. Me and Ms. Payne, we were talking about that too and how the sun just does so much for us that we can't even put words to because it's just so beautiful. And I think many didn't understand that until we had the pandemic, just how important the sun is and the vitamin D that we get from the sun and being able to get out every day and just enjoy that. So there's just so many self-care tools, you all, and tips out there. You just got to identify what works for you and be consistent. Yes. 
Yes, ma'am. That was, yes, absolutely what you said times a million. Absolutely. <laughs> because self-care, I mean, if we, we are no good to anyone. We're no good to anyone. Like you said, if we don't put that oxygen mask on first, we're no good to anyone if we don't take care of ourselves first. So I want to thank you, Dr. Izzy, for being a part of tonight's broadcast, for yeah. shining a light on secondary traumatic stress, for giving us tools. You gave us instruments. You let us go in your toolbox and look around and find exactly the tool that works for us, where someone may need a, re a wrench, someone else may need a hammer, maybe somebody just needed a nail, but you gave, uh, gave us each part of an element of a tool that we need to make this make this thing work to make this thing work and we're so appreciative of you also you guys please make sure that you connect she um, with her she had our information up on the screen be sure if you did not get it it's right there on the screen so just go just uh, after we finish just go back a little bit and then you'll be able to see up oh, how about that Screenshot, <laughs> be able to, you're at, it's right there, Shekinah, uh, counseling at gmail.com. It's how you would email her. You can find her right there on Facebook at Shekinah CCTS. And of course, on the web, on the World Wide Web at ShekinahCTS.com. Listen, Dr. Izzy, thank you so much. You've given us tools and resources. Um, it's, it's just amazing. This and actual goodness, that was exactly what I was just going to ask you to do. You are, you are, yes, I just love it. I love it. So we want you to get your hands on the, 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 the faith therapy that she was talking about. We want you to be able to grasp hold and have resources in your hands. She talked about the, she talked about the, uh, the, the essential oil. She talks about the, the oh my goodness, the, the breathing. That is so important. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I go outside, that was one of the things I actually showed my daughter yesterday. Um, well, that wasn't the first time, but the wind was blowing at such, it was a nice breeze blowing. I said, just be quiet mm -hmm. and just let's breathe this in. That deep breathing. She said, oh man, I see what you mean. I'm like, yeah, I kind of told you. <laughs> um, the mm -hmm. prayer walk and then the guided meditation Listen, there, I mean, she has these resources here. You see them at the bottom of the screen. I want you to connect with her. Go on her website, get these resources, get them. They are available to you. I'm, I'm telling you, screenshot this so you'll, you'll be able to know exactly where to go. You have no excuse, it's here for you. You have, you have it right here in your hand. Absolutely. And you all, all of my publications are on Amazon and they all have a thorough description. So you're welcome to go through and read that description and that will let you know if it's something for you, if it's something that you need. Okay. I love and it. If you don't mind, Ms. Payne, I'm going to close out in prayer with a scripture reference. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have one last thing and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Go ahead. If you all have not already picked up your book, there's no help without mental health. I'm one of the anthologists. I'm, I'm in the book. You'll see me right there. I'm in chapter three. You get to hear my actual personal story. You get to hear me talk about my personal experience and the other eight um, authors that are here. There are nine total authors in here. It's not a long read. It's not a, it's not a whole lot, but you get a lot of content. I'm telling you. So if you want an autographed copy, simply go to our website, painandglory.com, P-A-Y-N-E, and glory.com and uh, click on the pain in the pews tab and I will send you an autographed copy once you place your order so with that said Dr. Izzy thank you thank you so much and please close us out all right so you all I am going to pray from Jude 24 25 you're welcome to close your eyes or keep them open God heals us either way <laughs> And now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the all and only wise God, our Savior, 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining with us. Be sure to join us on next Monday, 7 o'clock p.m. We'll be joined by Nurse Tanji Henry. She is going to be with us. And we're going to be talking about the pandemic. We're going to be talking about the first liners, the first responders, those who are on the front lines and what's really going on behind the scenes. We we see them and we, we you know, we pray for them, but we want to hear from her. And then on the last uh, Monday of this month, we're going to be talking about men and the myth behind mental health with Dr. Brian Jones. So don't miss out. Love you guys. We'll see you next time. Take care and be blessed. Bye-bye.